Anthony is it Anach Kuhn um, is a beautiful, beautiful uh, lament, and it was composed by Anthony Araftera, the the blind poet, um, quite renowned in Ireland, and actually is buried not very far from me, which is quite auspicious. I found it was during COVID actually that I realised that he he was buried near me, and that was the time that I was doing a lot of preparatory work for the album as well. Um, and I first heard my brother sing it. And his way of singing it, I found so beautiful. I actually borrowed his 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 intonation. Um, and for me as well, it, it was le a learning curve for me in terms of singing out a song or actually being a little bit more uh, quiet with it, you know, in, in terms of um, in terms of not performing it outwards, but really being with it and being with the feeling of it. Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman. Kiara Conway is an Irish contemporary vocalist and visual artist, and this episode features music from her beautiful album Queen, as well as excerpts from some of her other projects. I find Kiara's curiosity about so many important topics around arts and culture really inspiring, and this conversation circled around to her explorations of different languages and cultures, as well as her rootedness as an Irish speaker. She's had many interesting commissions dealing with history, illness, grief, and the natural world. She uses traditional and contemporary song, performance, and visual art to explore social issues such as the ecological crisis, migration, and feminist concerns. She also spoke to me about some of her roles working with the Clare Arts Office with artists with disabilities, and how she started her career as a glassblower in Rome, and how her upbringing has helped her navigate the world as a freelance artist. This podcast is available wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as a video on my YouTube. Everything is linked on my website, leahroseman.com, where you can explore past episodes and support the show through my Ko-fi page linked in the description. Kiara, thanks so much for joining me here today. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I was just telling you before we started recording that a pretty high percentage of the podcast listeners actually live in Ireland because my episode with Martin Hayes was very popular. But uh, Great. Do, yeah. Do you know what regions? Yeah. <laughs> my neighbours, I want my neighbours to be listening. <laughs> but but many people, of course, uh, all over the world listen and, and don't know anything about Irish language or culture. So perhaps we'll, we'll touch on some of that. Okay, lovely. I thought it'd be nice to start with your life as a singer, because of course you do so much as an artist, mm -hmm. and I want to go into different aspects, but your beautiful album, I believe it's pronounced Queen? Queen, that's correct. Yes. yes. Uh, incredible laments. Can, can you speak to that album? Because I know when you started to think it through, it, it wasn't mm -hmm. how it ended up. No, um, so it, it's a kind of like, uh, it, took a, it took a long journey to get to Queen, because primarily I started out as a visual artist. Um, and then over the years, I had a public art practice, and I still do in a socially engaged practice using a lot of visual art and sculpture. But around 14 years ago or so, I learned I could sing. So singing wasn't something that I that I knew I could do growing up. Um, I come from Connemara in the Gaeltacht in um, the west coast of Ireland, outside Galway. And it's a Gaelic Gaelic speaking region, and I grew up speaking Irish. My mother is um, from Carrow, my father is from Wicklow. Uh, but singing wasn't something that we did in our family. And if, if anything, I kind of grew up knowing that, you know, Sarah Grealish and Nan Grealish and Nantan Tamin and being aware of their Shano's tradition. Um, and coming from Carrow, you would have known that certain families had this tradition in their family, whereas I would never have considered myself to have had that. Um, it came to me much later. Um, I was actually working in Rome as a glassblower and uh, my my friend and my flatmate in, in Rome one day said to me, do you realise you have a beautiful voice? Like, have you any idea how, how beautiful it is? And I was like, oh, go away with yourself. But she kept at me, you know, in terms of um, believing her. And at social occasions in Rome, she would always encourage me to sing a song. And that was really the beginning for me discovering that I had a voice. And I always had an interest in world music. Um, and for me, it made natural sense, like research is a huge part of my practice. So it made natural sense to start researching Shanos and the tradition of Shanos. Um, and I started singing it then. So it's not something I grew up with. And people are always surprised at that. They think that I grew up singing in the Erechtes and all the national competitions. Um, but no, it, it, it was new for me. But once I took to it, I felt like I had always been doing it. It felt very natural to me. 
Um, so a lot of the projects that I have been working on uh, once I started, once I realized I could sing, uh, kind of centered on the theme of loss. Uh, the first project that I did was commissioned by, um, the first project that I did using my voice was commissioned by CREATE, the Arts Council, and that was in 2013. And I was working with a group of asylum seekers uh, for two years. And we were working together to kind of look at, well, what themes or what issues did they want to, to explore in this project? And they wanted to look at grief, the theme of grief, the grief of having left their countries, uh, their families, not being able to return, and also the grief that they were experiencing living within the direct provision in Ireland. So in 2013, that was a system that wasn't spoken about a lot. It's a lot more visible now, but then it wasn't. Um, so they were cut off from the community in, within Ireland. They weren't allowed to work. They weren't allowed to engage with education. Very much isolated. And for them, that was an added grief. You know, another trauma having come, um, having had to leave their own place. So we, d I, I did a lot of research on the practice of lament. Um, and also on the traditional role of the Ban Quina. So the Ban Quina, um, the lamenting woman or the keening woman within our, the Irish tradition, her role, she had several roles. One was to, to perform the, and host the kind of keening ceremony for the deceased, where they would be eulogised, uh, sometimes often criticised as well, which is interesting. You know, in our day and age, when we eulogise somebody at their funeral, we have nothing but good things to say. But in, in, in the Irish tradition, it was also used as an opportunity to maybe na name things that they had done that weren't great, um, which is fascinating. I find that fascinating. And uh, Dr. Angela de Berka talks about that a lot as well. She's done a lot of research on the keening practices. Um, and her role through her, it wasn't singing then, it was the use of recitation and um, rhythm uh, and text uh, where she would have known a certain amount how do I say, there would have been a motif. So there would have been a certain motif to, to, to performing a lament. For example, the lineage of the person, where they came from, uh, certain attributes, um, both positives and negatives, um, things that they had done or achieved. Um, and she might then have improvised a little as well. So it was unique, but there were similar things in each lament that was performed. Um, and she was paid often through whiskey or sugar or flour. You know, they wouldn't have had money to change hands in those times. So I used that tradition. I drew upon it within a contemporary context. So I uh, devised a series of public lamentations where the beginning or the intro to that performance was calling on the community to, to realize that they were complicit in what was happening. Um, for, for these individuals living within the direct provision. And then a number of laments were composed uh, and performed, and also some testimonies were performed as that as well. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like a theatrical stroke music, but very politically driven um, type of perform performance. And that was the first of its kind that I had ever done in my own arts practice. Um, but I found it so powerful um, and so engaging um, on various levels. Uh, that it propelled me into working in that way since, like I've been working that way over the last 15, 16 years. So a lot of my projects focus on how we experience and express loss as communities and, and individuals in response to issues like the environmental crisis or how we, ex um, how we experience death and dying today and these days, what are our rituals and traditions or even uh, losses in response to illnesses or the loss of language. So there are many, there's many losses <laughs> as there are, you know, there, there are so many losses that we can speak to, but I use music and I use visual art to, to respond to these, these questions. So what happened was over the years, I, I had a number of laments that were growing, um, nearly a body of lament that had been used in these projects. Um, and at, at the same time, I was being invited to perform um, for what I would call traditional events on stage, which was very new for me. I had only ever performed in galleries or uh, site specific works. You know, when I say site specific, like in one project, we performed a series of events up to our necks and water in the sea, or I might, you know, um, perform in a hospital. Um, so I'm very interested in site specific work. So for me, the stage was a new context very, very different because you, you can't frame the work in the same way. 
Um, but I wanted to, it was the first time in my life that I had thought, okay, it's time for an album. It's time to bring these laments together. Um, and what changed for me, I suppose, was that I had set out to do an album of global lamentations because I, I sing in a variety of languages. But as we worked on the pieces, it was the Irish ones that seemed to to have a body of their own. It was almost like they needed to be on their own. And then the next step maybe to, would be to introduce the global ones. So that's how Queen came about. Um, and it was funded through Creative Ireland. And then I was very blessed. I got further funding to tour it nationally. Um, we performed it in the National Concert Hall and all over Ireland. And it was an amazing experience for me in a variety of ways. Um, quite often as a visual contemporary artist, you'll get funding to present a performance and it'll be a once off. Whereas to do a tour, I had the experience of what it meant to uh, reflect night after night to, and, you know, and to hone my craft as a singer. Um, and it's a completely different craft, but, but they, they, they blend, you know, they add to each other. They mm -hmm. definitely add to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I went off on a mad tangent there. <laughs> wonderful. This will be a wonderful place to share a track from your album. And you had mm -hmm. sent me a couple. One of them was about the boating accident and I hesitate to pronounce oh, any of the Irish. Oh, Anachun, is it? Yeah. Anach, yeah. So can you uh, tell a little bit of the story for people that don't sure. understand Irish? Yeah. Anthony, is it Anach Coon, um is a beautiful, beautiful uh, lament. And it was composed by Anthony Araftra, the, the blind poet, um, quite renowned in Ireland and actually is buried not very far from me, which is quite auspicious, I found. It was during COVID, actually, that I realised that he, he was buried near me. And that was the time that I was doing a lot of preparatory work for the album as well. Um, and I first heard my brother sing it. And his way of singing it, I found so beautiful. I actually borrowed his 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 intonation. Um, and for me as well, it, it was le a learning curve for me in terms of singing out a song or actually being a little bit more uh, quiet with it, you know, in, in terms of um, in terms of not performing it outwards, but really being with it and being with the feeling of it. Um, and it's based on a true story of uh, a lot of men, women and children who were on a boat and the boat capsized on a still day. Um, they say that it happened because a sheep or, or an animal put its foot through the, the boat, that the, the actual mm. the making of the boat was weak, um, but it was a huge tragedy. And during performances, I often bring it up and talk to, audience, to, to, to the audiences about how many years ago they had no means of recording what sound was like but through songs and stories and historical narratives through how people described sound we can maybe get a sense of the sounds people made or or what the landscape sounded like and within the song there are quite a number of descriptions around what how people expressed their grief and so we we ruig ha hirugs vi an so people were tearing at their hair and uh, and the grief was shared. So I do very much so believe, believe uh, and it still happens in certain tribes and cultures um, today, maybe more in African countries or Arabic countries where the expressions of grief are more collective and mm -hmm. they are more physical and probably more outward orally, you know, in terms of groups of women coming together and and lamenting together um, collectively, which is quite powerful in itself. Mawim shuslante is father vaistrochta er ameita wahu asan nakun mahrua amaira. Kaha hir is mahir, Sarabal is pashed, Sir Is 
Lach of Rolesh Gan Rui is Gan Washtach Slam of Ada Kuzer Skuber Shu Nach Morantina Os Kornadina Queen to say I, I've looked it up at one point but I forget what mm-hmm. does Shan Nos actually mean um, it just means the old way so Shan means old and Nos means way um, and yeah th- th- it's, it's a form of a cappella singing unaccompanied um, and would have been sung traditionally in, in Ireland uh, in Irish it's such a powerful album and I'd actually listened to it several times before I found out what it was about okay uh, but I felt the sadness and, mm. and it was, it really, it was interesting not knowing the words or what any of the title, I hadn't looked anything up. Interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. It's, it's so beautiful. And I wanted to ask you, so you arranged with um, Sean. That's correct. Mac yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sean is amazing. Um, I'd never worked with him before. I, I was aware of his work already. He, his background is in jazz and in improvisation. And just the caliber of his work and also his sensitivity. What really drew me to him was nearly his m- minimal approach in terms of arranging. I, I personally don't think um, Shano's works if it's overly arranged. It, it needs space because it's so melodic and ornamented already that I, I find that, I, I mean, I could be proved wrong, <laughs> but if too much is done with it, it, it gets in the way of the song. I feel and Sean was very, very sensitive to that. Um, and I also worked with Kevin Murphy on cello. He's uh, an unbelievable uh, cello player and also know Brian on um, vi- violin, viola. And we had Francesco Teresi 
um, playing on piano, well, the inside of a piano, which was amazing, for mm -hmm. the, the track called um, Unquina, um, which is one of my favourite laments. He decided he, he didn't want to play the piano. He stood up and he opened the piano itself and started playing the inside of it. And it was exquisite what he did. Mm -hmm. Very sensitive. And Sean also added um, the clarinet and and uh, very minimal use of, of synth and electronic music as well. Um, but I enjoyed the process it, because it was my first album. I was probably too precious and any I, I've yet to meet a musician who has made an album who doesn't say the same thing when once when you've done your first one, you look back and you think, OK, next time I'll loosen up a little <laughs> bit more because you want it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, sometimes it needs a little bit more room to breathe. The process needs a little bit more room to breathe. But that, that's a learning curve for any mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew that you sang in different languages, but I haven't mm -hmm. heard that. Which languages have you sung in? Um, Arabic, Latin, um, Georgian, Portuguese, Fado. And basically I can sing nearly any language I put my ear to. For some interesting reason, I have an ear for sound. And if I listen to a song long enough, which is a lovely meditation in itself, mm -hmm. um, because it entails listening and listening and, you know, down to the my, most minute sound and uh, mimicking it. Um, and not just mimicking it, but getting into the feeling of it. Um, so it's a beautiful exercise in itself. And I'm very interested in how perhaps you can embody physically another uh, another culture through singing. Mm -hmm. um, so I mightn't like obviously understand everything, like I'll have a translation. Um, but yeah, I love singing songs in other languages. It's it's a definitely a huge grow of mine. And actually, sometimes in performances, people get confused. They don't know which is the Irish or which is uh, another language, because I usually sing traditional folk songs from other cultures. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge similarity between African and um, Portuguese sometimes and even Georgian. Yeah. I've had people say that was a great Irish song and it's an African song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, I recorded um, Juro Len by Omo Singare and uh, I sent it to her and um, through uh, a musician called Shay Kamala. He came to Connemara recently and I had the opportunity to be invited to explore Shano's and African music with him. And he knows Umu quite well and he sent it to her and she was like, she thinks it's amazing. I was like, <laughs> so I was delighted. That was the biggest, um, the biggest thumbs up for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with her. Uh, so Umo Sangare is, um, she would be from, considered of the Wasalu, the Wasalu singers. Um, it, it's Ma and from Mali. She's done a lot of work with, um, oh, what's his name? The famous banjo player. Uh, he produced that film called Throw Down Your Heart, um, Bella Fleck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she would have performed a lot with him. But in her own right, she's a very renowned yeah. world music singer. Yeah. When Bela Fleck came to Ottawa with mm -hmm. that, when he, after I had seen Throw Down Your Heart, that's an amazing yes. film. Yeah. And then he ca actually came here with these musicians. Okay, wow. A number of wow, years wow, ago. Wow, wow. That was yeah. incredible. I, I would love to go to that region specifically because the women still hold, uh, the women performers and singers still hold that position of being the voice for, you know, uh, others who ha who don't have a voice or speaking out to political situations and things like that. So they still see their role um, as being intertwined with the, with the social responsibility, you know, very mm -hmm. much so. Yeah, which I, I really kind of admire and find very powerful. Mm -hmm. Now, it sounded uh, in my research that you had a very um, free childhood creatively. Your parents mm -hmm. were, you know, your mom was an artist. You yes. grew up by the sea. <laughs> yes, I know it sounds idyllic. <laughs> it was, but I look like when I think of it. So Connemara, where I'm from in Cairo, it's called Nkiaru, which means the red quarter because the uh, the land has quite of a reddish hue to it. Um, and we were surrounded by beaches. Um, my father had a shop and my mother worked in the post office. And I think given in a different time and culture, they might have had creative careers, you know, but mm -hmm. the opportunities were not as, uh, I was going to say, flourish. they weren't as available then. Um, but my mother did apply for and was offered a scholarship to the Rhode Island School of Art when she was 17, but her parents didn't let her go. So she still often wonders what her life might have been like had she um, been allowed to do that. 
but I grew up uh, around her tools. I would often steal them. <laughs> um, uh, but she, you know, she was creative in everything that she touched her hands to, whether it was making salads or painting walls um, or painting in general. She was a great, she is a great watercolorist. And my father then was great with people, you know, in terms of communication, a great conversationalist, interested in everything and could talk to anybody, no matter what area of life they came from. Um, and that definitely came through his work in the shop. You know, I think a lot of people came to the shop because they just love talking to him. Um, and I think I drew upon those two aspects from both my parents. Um, and, and also the, the, the etiquette of business, you know, being business minded. Um, I definitely think I've been able to survive as an artist because I grew up with two parents who were more or less self-employed. Um, and understanding the economics of, of and, and also the logistics and the practicalities of being an artist. Um, not every artist have, has that. And sometimes, unfortunately, artists who don't have it, who are brilliant, um, don't have an opportunity to flourish as much, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, yeah. So I was lucky that I grew up with that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, where do I want to go with this? Mm -hmm. um, the landscape probably, well, I, yeah, having grown up in Connemara. Sure, if you want to mm. speak to that. I definitely think, hmm. Contemporary art was not something that surrounded me in Connemara. Um, Edward Delaney actually, um, well, actually, sometimes it doesn't take that much, but Ed Edward Delaney was a contemporary sculptor and he lived in Cairo. And again, we would have um, played on a tiny beach that was near his house and it would have been OK for me. And I did it many times. I'd wander up and wander through his workshop. So. <laughs> Um, his son actually has written a book and has said that it's like a scene from a Gabriel Garcia Marquez book, you know, this thing where, uh, you know, a sculptor in a tiny rural village in, in Ireland is making these elaborate abstract sculptures that all of the locals don't understand, but somebody in India or New York does. Um, so that was interesting, you know, to have those people in the community with whom I could probably identify with, you know, even in secondary school. Uh, because I abstract art was something that I was hugely interested in secondary school then. And I always knew I wanted to be an, an artist. And I suppose the first time I went to art college, I realized I wasn't that brilliant at drawing or painting. It took me a while to find my mediums. Mm -hmm. um, and contemporary art, I suppose, isn't as a new or, or as old, sorry, as the traditional practices of storytelling and music in Ireland, which have been happening for for, you know, since the beginning, the beginning of culture here. Yeah. Hi, just a short break from the episode, which I hope you're enjoying so far. If you want to check out over 100 episodes you may have missed, in addition to your podcast player or YouTube, I have an extensive website, leahrosemond.com, with show notes, transcripts, the complete catalogue of episodes, and you can sign up there for my weekly newsletter to get access to sneak peeks of upcoming guests. Please do share your favorite episodes with your friends, follow me on social media and share my posts. And if you can spare a few dollars to help support the series, that would be amazing. And you can find that link in the show notes. I'm an independent podcaster and I really do need the help of my listeners. Now back to the episode. So you studied glass blowing in Scotland. What was that, exper Ooh. What was that experience like? It was, um, so I went, I, st I studied fine art first mm -hmm. and then I learned there that I was much more, uh, I was much more an artist who preferred making things with their hands and in a collaborative way. Uh, so when I left college in Galway, I did an apprenticeship in a stained glass studio um, because I loved colour and mm -hmm. I, I kind of made, not a logical move, but um, somehow an organic move into stained glass, thinking this was a, a great way to explore colour and also through architecture, you know, in terms of scale. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I was very excited by that and the fact that you um, an opportunity to engage with the public so when you're working in glass it's quite um, work related to a degree if that makes sense like the 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 artist in the studio to a degree has an isolated practice where I, I prefer practices that bring me in contact with the world mm -hmm. um, and from that apprenticeship I realized I missed making sculptural work and I decided to return to college in Scotland where I studied glass uh, so I studied sculptural glass and glass blowing and stained glass there. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I have an adventurous spirit that, that then took me to Rome. I had a friend who it was from Italy. She had a grant to set up a studio and she didn't want to do it on her own. And I had finished college in uh, Edinburgh and I didn't know what to do next. So she was like, come over and help me set up the studio. So I did. Um, and I wasn't the best glass blower, <laughs> you know, but we had fun. Um, and I love collaborating with people and I, I enjoyed working with her. And actually, when I was over there, I decided um, I decided to apply for some exhibitions in Rome. And that was the first time I had a solo exhibition with more contemporary work was in Campo del Fiore in Rome. Um, I actually challenged myself because at a point over there, at a point over there, I thought, what am I doing over here? <laughs> Do you know, and I'm, I'm not an amazing glass blower. And I was like, OK, you can't leave until you've achieved something. <laughs> so I set that challenge for myself to have my first my first exhibition over there. Um, and then I decided it was time to come back. And I, 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 I re-entered Ireland by um, applying to do a public art um, master's in Dublin and NCAD. And again, then moved into public art sculptures, which was another 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 string, <laughs> another okay. string to play. <laughs> Yeah. And you brought the singing back with you as well. Um, I did. I brought the very beginning seeds of singing. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because even now when I meet people and they say, oh, I can't sing, but I'd love to. I'm like, honestly, <laughs> go for it, you know, because it, it builds over time and it, it does take time. When I moved back, I met um, a man called Matthew Noon. He was a classical sarod player. And he set up an Indian fusion band and uh, and yeah, invited me to sing in his band. So I ended up singing ragas and shanos with uh, Indian classical music. Okay. And it was my first time being in a band of any kind. Um, <laughs> great fun. Uh, I wasn't always very confident because I was still finding my voice and f- finding my performance self. Um, but that was the beginning. That was the beginning of, of singing out loud in front of people. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Actually, t- <laughs> tomorrow I have an interview with a sitar player who does oh, a cool. lot of interesting collaborations. And... Brilliant. Yeah. It, interesting. It's interesting, like, because they have this uh, improvisatory tradition, mm. there can be a lot of uh, different um, explorations with different cultures. Yeah. yeah. And I love how they perform, you know, depend or compose depending on the time of day and all of these mm-hmm. nuances. It's really, really interesting. I love intricate um, time patterns as well. They interest me. Mm-hmm. They interest my brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't perform with Matthew anymore, but he's a dear friend, and he now coordinates um, the world music uh, course for the Irish World Academy in in UL. Yeah, he's always at me to go and do a PhD. Someday I might. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you'd mentioned your your research and your love of reading. Mm -hmm. Are there books about creativity or culture or music or any of these topics that you could recommend to us? Oh, stop. Um, (laughs) It's it's a hard question because like my walls are lined with books. I'm reading um, at the moment. It's in front of me by coincidence. It's called This Woman's Work by Sinead Gleeson. It's very, very good. I literally just got um, right now. Oh, this one. This arrived in the post today, The Spirit of Intimacy, um, Ancient African Teachings, <laughs> which I love. Oh yeah, and also uh, I'm reading this, which seems to be everybody's go-to at the moment, Rick Rubin, The Creative Way. Uh, so Rick Rubin is a music producer, but doesn't have any technical ability, but has a lot, a lot, a lot of wisdom around process mm-hmm. in terms of um, opening yourself open to process. But my, 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 my research, like for example, I'm very interested in, apologies now, I'm jumping all over the place. Uh, I'm interested in everything. So I'm reading every, this at the moment, Crowds and Power. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm fascinated by the choreography of crowds, you know, in terms of performance, in terms of the cavalcade, in terms of the audience. Um, like I just opened this now and coincidentally it's called the lamenting pack you know again looking at how people physically come together when they lament um he's talked about how in some cultures when when the the the, the bereaved uh 
would fall down in their grief that other the other people would jump on top of them nearly as a protective barrier you know that they would hold them physically which uh, which is really fascinating i'm also reading rachel carson silent spring mm -hmm. um because i'm looking at the moment of composing a number of laments um you know uh, i did a commission for a hospital recently and i was looking at medicinal plants that are becoming extinct and because they're becoming extinct extinct it means certain medicines won't be available um so the loss of that so something as 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 broad as rachel carson looking at the environmental crisis will come will inspire a song yeah that project is it very Veriditas? yeah yes so actually, uh, there's a clip from that that we'll be able mm -hmm. to share. The, the idea of the, the noise in the hospital, which is quite disturbing. Mm, I, met a, um, I met a senior engineer called Frank Karam. That was part of, part of my research for the commission was I was invited to engage with the community of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that meant everybody from the pastoral worker to palliative care workers, nurses, doctors, patients. Um, I spoke to nearly 30 people. Um, and then outside of the hospital, I met with um, sound healers, um, herbalists, um, lots of different kind of lots of different practitioners who engage with healing through sound. So I was looking at traditional medicine and also current medicine practices. But Frank um, was had written a thesis and was doing current research on how sound adversely affects healing within hospitals. So his work is showing how at certain times in the hospital, like uh, the cleaners will start activating hoovers, mops, mm. opening bins. And he can show through his research that at that band, that time, the healing, the, the healing, um, sorry, the capacity of, of patient lowers because the body starts paying attention to sound instead of the body. Mm -hmm. So it's using its energy to, I suppose, cope with the adverse uh, stress feelings of sound so all of that energy is being used on that instead of on the illness so it's, it's i found that fascinating yeah and I, I composed a piece of music around that so the the track or the song that i composed called veriditas that was inspired by hildegard von bingham who was a really well um, known abbess or, or from the medieval times who ran an, a nunnery but also was um very prolific in composing chants and also her writings and she had a huge interest in the power of plants and she actually coined the term veriditas which means the green the greening power um and so i just took that word uh, in that song veriditas and uh then the latin words uh potentia verde the potential of, of green mm -hmm. um for me this was an exploratory exploratory phase around con composing contemporary work where you might just take one or two words and um, explore melodies and, 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 and see like a bit like Meredith Monk. I really love Meredith Monk's work. This is a short excerpt from Viriditas, the title track from the album Viriditas. Viriditas, 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 I was just thinking, you know, maybe like the way we evolved in a very quiet environment mm. that loud sounds meant danger generally so that our yeah, stress hormones yeah. absolutely yeah. and when you're delicate and vulnerable and very raw when you're sick 
God, one thing I can never understand is waiting rooms and doctors' offices with loud radios. Mm. The amount of times I've sat in a waiting room going, you know, when you're ill and there's a loud uh, radio show on and I'm like, does anybody realise that when you're sick, the last thing you can cope with is, is loud noise? I think you're extra sensitive to it when you're ill. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, and then another piece that I composed was Plant Chant. And in each verse of Plant Chant, I took a plant and I extol, ex eulogised the, the medicinal qualities of, of that plant in, in, in the verse, it, through Irish. This is Plant Chant from the album Viriditas. This plant eulogy poem is composed by Kiara Conway, and I'll link the Irish to the show notes on my website. Baha nua, los wides in a widow, rail tibuin atalun la su full zarug. Lysian tu and dulugar is in brown is divna. Baha nua is los chulam chilla. Reen a livena, fadeen she. On veir zaul a dortin on chri. Los moor mercon she. Los cre, los naman she. Lesule gle gurama is tu ban reen na livena. Los namanaltra. Los on na nain, los mianla machara milish deal. O nyanto kul fache, full on is tani, bikinse id iche tri ura sele. Bahu is lonlu, glas is gruigach, shannor nyanto agas trenach. Malacht adavan, run on lay. Varaman vrida klog na guiche, lais ischul fien na grena, grodom, grodom nach, baranon, bernach. O viridisima virga, ave que invento so. Flabro shishita sionis, Santorum prodisti. Etila aparu erunt omnia, in viriditates plena. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I did want to talk a little bit about you. You had an administrative job for many years with the Claire Arts mm -hmm. Office, and you were mm -hmm. involved with this program Embrace with Arts yes. and Disabilities. Yeah, um, I actually just finished that post last week. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked in the Claire Arts Office as their coordinator for their Arts and Disability program called Embrace. Um, and I also the coordinator for the Arts and Schools program. I had huge, huge, uh, um, like an interest in both programs, but definitely probably slightly more in the arts and disability um, because there's so much to evolve in that area and to uh, to push and challenge um, in terms of the opportunities that we offer to artists with disabilities, the context in which we create to, for their work to be shown um, in terms of equity with other professional artists. Um, and also supporting them so that they can apply for funding, you know, the, the same ways as anybody um, who might have more abilities in that area, you know, to make it far more equitable competitively. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the roles that I had was to support professional artists to facilitate workshops in uh, daycare centres. Um, and then, so that we did a lot of that in the beginning. We, we worked with over 300 participants and 30 different organizations in County Clare. And they have partnered with the program for the last 18 years. I've only been in the last seven. Um, but one thing that I did in my position was I tailored the award system a little bit more. 
so that, for example, um, an artist who might not attend a daycare centre, but who had a professional practice could also apply for an award. Or if somebody within the group, uh, if the coordinator could identify that one or two or three people had skills and they could see that there was an interest beyond the hobby, that this individual wanted to progress a little bit further, perhaps with more one-to-one -one tuition, that we created an award for that to happen. So kind of teasing out a little bit more the variety of interest, the variety of um, skill and ambition and, and trying to meet all those very kind of nuanced needs um, within the programme. Um, and every year we had an exhibition in Glore. It's a theatre and an exhibition space in County Clare, a beautiful space. Um, so that was an annual ex uh, exhibition where participants could show their work um, and perform as well because it was across all art forms. Um, and also, we just recently commissioned um, a research piece mapping arts and disability practices in the West between Galway, Mayo and Clare. Um, and that was an eye opener to a degree. You know, sometimes when you commission reports, you know what needs to be done, but it's it's great to have it, you know, in detail. So there is still a lot to be done to be done in terms of access. Um, in terms of how do you reach individuals who don't attend uh, state governed daycare centres uh, who might have more isolatory practices and who don't kind of have the, uh, how do I say it, the art world uh, experience of checking certain websites for funding opportunities and things like that. Um, yeah, and also, again, that thing of, you know, in the absence of diplomas or master programs that 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 can support an individual with disability how else can somebody enter these these uh, training these training opportunities like everybody else mm -hmm. um, only recently the first person the first artist in ireland received an honorary diploma for his life's work as a visual artist um from a university that was that was the first time that ever happened um and i think we need more of that absolutely Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, this is this um, topic has come up in different ways with a few guests I've spoken with okay. um, in Australia and Canada. And I'm always interested, like those were more not not just music specific, but a little more music mm -hmm. specific. Yeah, actually, one project I can mention um, that we uh, commissioned was it was through the invitation to collaboration scheme with the Arts Council um, and uh, we approached the Irish Memory Orchestra. You might have heard of them, um, the director and the composers, uh, Dave Flynn. So the Irish Memory Orchestra are unique. They used to be um, actually they're not called the Irish Memory Orchestra. They're just called the Memory Orchestra now. Mm -hmm. But they're unique in that they don't use sheet music and that, and they're a fully fledged orchestra. Wow. Um, in Ireland. And so we worked with a number of visually impaired professional musicians who don't have the opportunity to perform with an orchestra because they can't read the sheet music. Mm -hmm. So this project specifically brought the methods of the memory orchestra together with the visually impaired um, musicians um, to compose uh, a new piece of work around the, the theme of vision. And uh, they performed the premiere of it in County Clare. So it, it was, um, and we was very kind of, I, I suppose we had to really think outside the box in terms of how they learned the music. So. Uh, there was a lot of preparatory work done in terms of uh, braille music, in terms mm -hmm. of the sheet music. Also, all of the orchestral pieces were recorded to MIDI and recorded um, in audio format. And we set up a specific website where the musicians could access all of that material. Mm -hmm. uh, so we learned a lot um, from that. And as, as far as I'm aware, it's still continuing that, that that opportunity is still open and they're building on that. Wonderful. That's really great. Yeah, I had not heard of the Memory Orchestra. Um, there's a yeah, couple of uh, really amazing um, pianists who had performed with my orchestra in the past year who were blind. Like, okay, interesting. Yeah, completely, yeah. like not just visually impaired. So it's always very interesting to, to think about that. Yeah. Uh, if we could go back to Queen. So there's another mm -hmm. one. There was a lullaby about the fairies and yes. childhood mortality. And I, yeah. again, I cannot pronounce the title. Sh Shaheen Shahol. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my favourite songs. I love it. Um, and 
quite often audience members um, cry when they hear this. And I think my, my dreaming into it is, is it's a tender song. There's something very beautiful in the melody. Um, and I love singing it. Like I sang it for my sister's uh, christening for, the for her first daughter. And I was quite moved by it as well because you're wishing, you're wishing uh, blessings for the child, you know, and, and a kind of a, a presence of love. Uh, by Michelle of the Heel, the Guir, the Vamach, I'll be by your side, you know. Um, yeah, even now I get emotional. There's something beautiful about just imagining into, I'll be by your side, you know, praying for your blessings. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, the context of the lament, uh, for me, it's not a lament, but during the famine times, the motif of fairies coming to take your child away was was used as a symbol of, um, was used as a symbol for, for death. It, so if the fairies came and took your child away, Quite often that was around, uh, cot, you know, sorry, uh, what's the terminology when a child dies in their sleep? Is it cot death? Uh, well, sudden infant death That's syndrome. Yeah. Yes. And also from starvation. Um, yeah. So th th that kind of use of, of the fairies taking children away was used a lot during the famine times. Mm. And, you know, it's an ancient thing and we still do it. We, we create stories in order to make sense of the world. And, or, and also, I think, to create a barrier of protection. Do you know, it, it, it might be hugely difficult to sing about your child dying of starvation. So it's maybe a form of self-protection or a way of creating an art if that helps you cope with it, that you say that your child was taken by the fairies mm -hmm. in the same way that we say the angels take our loved ones away. Um, you know, there is, for me, there's no difference.
I remember many years ago talking to somebody uh, about, I forget which community it was, but where they're, they practiced infanticide because of these, yeah, starvation. There was just too many children mm. and they had like rituals around it that were, yeah. yeah very... Do you know what culture that was? I, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me know if you think of it. It sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you had mentioned you know singing in in georgian and arabic mm -hmm. have you you haven't traveled to all these places surely um not all these places i've traveled a lot um i did go to georgia f okay. uh, specifically for for that um so the georgian singing when i was doing research for the hospital project i was looking at georgian healing songs and um i applied for funding to go to georgia to to learn these songs from an ensemble called en ensemble Ilauni. Um, they're one of the forefront um, ensemble singers of, of traditional folk, Georgian folk songs. They're exquisite singers, like unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I spent a f uh, two weeks over there uh, living with Nino. She's the director of the ensemble and she teaches in a conser conservatoire. And we sang together every day and it was just gorgeous, you know, and a long lasting friendship has arisen from that. Um, and during COVID, actually, I, I attended numerous uh, Georgian singing workshops with her every week. Um, that was something that I did to get through COVID, <laughs> singing Georgian songs with, with everybody online. Um, I, and I love the, the Georgian practice of singing together, you know, the, the harmonic practice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Uh, when, when I learned I could sing, I was very much um, not interested in choirs. It was, I think there was something there around, I've just discovered this, and I want to be heard. <laughs> mm. um, and now that I've done that and probably grown a little bit more myself um, relationally um, and also in my practice, now I'm re really loving the what choral ensembles can 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 offer to a mm. performance. I did a choral conducting um, course in UL during the summer, and it blew my heart open. Do you know? Mm. To sing every day with over 50 people, um, there wasn't a day where I don't think any of us weren't moved. Um, there's just something very special about people singing together mm -hmm. um, and what you can do vocally with, with a group of people as opposed to a solo voice, uh, yeah. you know, is astonishing. Yeah. A couple of uh, previous guests I've had on um, have... Uh, part of their work has been working with community choirs. Mm -hmm. uh, Kavisha Metzella in Australia and Paulina Shepherd in England. And yeah, it, you know, like non audition choirs or people's different abilities. And it, mm -hmm. it's it's something like I'm a violinist and I, I play in ensembles, but I've never sung in a choir. It, you know, I've just mm -hmm. never had that opportunity. It just seems yeah. great. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I can't sight read. I'm, I'm trying to learn at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so thankfully they had different levels. I was very level one, but um, we had the opportunity to observe like level five, you know, and they were, uh, you know, at the top of their game. 
And when you really got to see the, syn the synthesis between an excellent conductor mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, you know, obviously singers who could read sight music very well, you could see the symbiosis. You could see how it became an, a, a, an entity in itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was very interesting to me. Also, the choreography of conducting. Yeah. Um, the dance, you know. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. I have a lot of learning to do. I want to learn how to sight read music. I think it's a superpower. <laughs> yeah, to be able to look at a sheet and, and just sing off it. Yeah. Well, you read all those books, you'll be able to yes. get them. <laughs> to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Before we leave Georgia, like I know their script is so beautiful. I don't mm -hmm. know, is that language part of the Indo-European language family? Yeah, I don't know. I do know they're considered a European country. But um, when I look at it, what's that word? I don't know why the word Cyrillic is coming into my mind. I think it's not it's... Cyrillic that they use no, there. No, it's not. No, no, I don't know what it is. Um, no, no idea. But it's stunning to look at. It nearly looks Arabic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like Finnish is not a Indo-European language. Hungarian okay. is not. It's not every European country is part of that. But but Irish is. Like, Irish is. Yes. But it's They're further, really... like, it's a further cousin. Yeah. It's Euro-Asian, definitely. Yeah. And that's what makes our culture so interesting is that uh, it's in some level it's European and in other levels it's completely not. Like, you know, they had such a connection with the Silk Road and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's No, I found it fascinating over there. And also their history with Russia, do you know, in terms of trying to preserve their culture and their mm -hmm. singing. Um, yeah. No, no, similar to the Irish, I suppose, as well, you know, or any culture where, where another entity tried to colonize them. Uh, let's talk about, um, again, the pronunciation. Do, mm -hmm. Is it dochas? Dochas? Uh, dochas? Yes, dochas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dochas means hope. Yeah. The water so, ensemble and all of that. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in, I can't remember what year it was, but I was um, invited by Waterways Ireland and Erachtas um, Nagoyge to create a piece of work in response to a, specific, a particular story. So myself and another artist, um, Nolani Phelan, were, were invited to create work in response to it. So the story was, and it's a true story, of several fishermen from Karna, a, small, a tiny village in Connemara, um, were given money by a company called Gwailin. So Gwailin, uh, they produce um, albums of Irish music. But in the 1950s, they also supported a lot of socio-economic um, enterprises um, in the Goyalthacht areas because they were experiencing a lot of, um, I suppose, a lot of uh, job losses, economic loss um, for a variety of reasons. But at the time, these fishermen were competing with the big trawlers. So they were given money to buy bigger boats and they left their village and they had to go up north to collect these boats and they brought them back down through the waterways. But what interested me most was that these men had never left their villages before, ever. So for them, it was nearly like I likened it to the universal journey, you know, like um, Joseph Campbell or the Odyssey, where the individual sets out on a life changing um, journey and they face trials and tribulations and they return. <laughs> um, so it's it's kind of like a, a universal psychological journey that we all take. Sometimes it means leaving home and sometimes you you don't have to. Um, so I decided to follow their journey, these different places that they would have gone through, including the canals going through Kildare and Nace. Um, and where they started their journey, obviously, which was in Karna. And they also went through the Ordnacrusha Lock, which was the hydroelectrical dam that was built in Shannon, Ordnacrusha, which was a massive, massive, massive um, enterprise. Like in terms of architecture, it was a huge engineering feat for its time. Uh, so I decided I would perform in each of these places and make a vocal kind of video performance. Um, so in one of the videos, I am singing or on the wall, which is a, a lament. But I'm in the boat as the dam is is lowering. So you see the you see the, my background changing as I'm as I'm going down. And the performance kind of gestures that I take, um, I was exploring gestures that might have been used traditionally. So in traditional times, when somebody sang Shanos, they would have covered their faces with their hands or they would have turned their backs and sang into the corner of the room. 
Um, and if there, people have different reasons or rationales for this. Some say that it was because of shyness. Some say it was to, to, to kind of like, that the emphasis wasn't on performing outward. It was, you know, bringing the person behind and letting the song come out further. But I was exploring it in more of a contemporary performative gesture. And when I, when I look at that video now, I think it looks quite amphibian. I look almost fish-like, <laughs> which, which fits with the dam. Um, and then I decided as well, like sometimes for me with each project, I think, okay, what can I try here that I've never done before that I'm interested in? I had never composed for an ensemble. Um, so I formed uh, the Water Ensemble with a group of um, singing students from the Irish World Academy. And for one of the pieces, I created kind of three movements, just using the two words, dochus and hope, and um, composed uh, three different melodies for for that piece. Um, so it was brilliant. Yeah, and I, I, I hope now in, in work this year that I'm going to compose for more ensembles. Um, I haven't done so since. Mm -hmm. This is a short excerpt from Dochas. So you'd mentioned these workshops learning Georgian chant. I know mm -hmm. more recently you had um, Hannah Tuliki taught you to do some oh, yes. bird sounds. Yes, yes, yes. That was great crack. Um, I can't say I mastered it in one day. <laughs> we certainly laughed a lot, um, but I'm fascinated by her practice. Uh, her, she has a long-standing practice, an interest in this area um, of what she calls, I can never say it or pronounce it properly, mimesis, the, the act of... Uh, mimicking or mirroring mm -hmm. animal sounds or sounds from nature and she's been doing it a long 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 time um and has a beautiful practice like and she shared with me some of her techniques and methods include like to 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 kind of nearly learn how to vocalize like a seagull she she recommends like putting you know the way you put water in your mouth to gargle mm -hmm. like that's that's the kind of access point that you nearly need to be practicing to get to that kind of throat sound of the seagull. Um, uh, the reason, one of the reasons why I went to her was because I was invited by Ormston House Cultural Centre to uh, respond to uh, the corn creek. Um, so the corn creek is a bird in Ireland and it is becoming distinct, um, extinct, what am I saying distinct? It is distinct, but becoming <laughs> extinct. And there is a conservation group called Corn Creek Life, and they're doing everything they can, and they're well funded by the EU um, to preserve the corn creek. There's currently <laughs> around uh, 300 corn creeks in Ireland, um, which is quite a small number. Mm. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, what, what, that's what brought me into wondering about vocalising like a bird. Um, yes, mm. and I haven't, like the, 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 the corn creek doesn't sound very melodic. <laughs> It uh, it actually has a sound that years ago people used to um, used to curse each other. You know, they used to curse like me in Irish. It would be uh, they would say, "Shanor uh, nianto, shanor like malacht adavan room and lay." You know, the curse of the corn crake be on you, and that may you don't like that you won't have a night's sleep because if there was a field of corn crakes, it was the loudest okay. and most annoying sound that you could hear. <laughs> Yeah, um, it actually, if you want to hear what one sounds like, if you get a comb and you brush it, that's what mm -hmm. a corn creek sounds like. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and the Latin name is onomatopoeic. So if you say crex, crex, it, enough times, you'll know what it sounds like. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Yeah, very cool. And it was interesting to to learn about Hannah Tuliki too, because I hadn't yeah, heard of her. Brilliant. Yeah, I really like her work a lot. There's one project we haven't spoken of yet. Um, mm -hmm time to say goodbye oh I yeah i found that really compelling that uh, if you want to speak to that of course um so i, I was invited by uh, the nerve center in derry and the ulster museum to create a piece of vocal work in response to world war one so it was very broad 
I almost researched too much for that project. <laughs> Sometimes you can read too much. Um, so I was looking at so many different things, you know, in terms of how even they create these huge architectural concrete um, shapes to capture sound. Um, I was looking at how they had tiny gramophones that they would bring out with them out into the field. Um, and I was looking at a lot at conscription songs, you know, how songs were utilised as a way of guilting or shaming people into joining the army or propaganda. Mm. Um, and I came across that song Grace, which was composed around a similar time. Um, and that was uh, looking at Joseph, I think it's, I hope I could be completely wrong now, I'll be shot for saying it, but uh, Joseph Plunkett was, was executed and he had 15 minutes to say goodbye to his partner, Grace. Um, and at the same time, it wasn't, it wasn't the same time, but my father had died and I had a very kind of um, intimate understanding of what it's like to be told that you have a certain amount of time to say goodbye to somebody because he was on a machine. Um, and then I started thinking more about saying goodbye within the context of a war or mm. and what that means and how many people would have said goodbye to each other, you know, wives to husbands or children's to their parents. Um, and not knowing whether you'd ever see somebody again. Uh, so I explored that with the Derry traditional singers in terms of that's the song. But then I break the song down into a more uh, spoken word piece um, that is simply just talking to uh, the words, you have 15 minutes. You have 15 minutes to say goodbye to somebody you love. Um, and kind of deconstructed that more and more and more. Um, and I found it was quite powerful. Like it, the recording I made that I actually used was an exploratory um, session. Mm -hmm. But even sometimes you can be in the middle of doing something and when you're doing it, you're like, this feels very strong. And I just trusted my my gut that that, that was enough, that this, mm -hmm. this spoken word piece was enough around saying goodbye. Um, I'm glad you liked it. I also um, decided in terms of the visual aspect of the work to take casts of the gramophone horn that I had mm -hmm. um, and I made numerous casts using paper, the simple process of paper mache. So I had these beautiful um, shapes of gramophone horns and I spray painted them white and they ended up without intending to, they ended up looking like lilies. Um, which somebody told me kind of are associated with funeric, um, funeric rites of passage sometimes. Mm. And so the piece played through these, these white lilies um, in the installation. Mm -hmm. This is a short excerpt from Time with the Dairy Traditional Singers. You grew up speaking Irish with your mother, if I understand. That's correct. Yeah, I was a bilingual family. Yeah. And all children in Ireland learned Irish in school. But do you mm -hmm. think there's, as, uh, has it gone down like the, uh, the percentage of families actually speaking it as their first language? Um, it depends on the region, because not all Irish, not all schools in Ireland are, um, are Gwale schools, as we call them. But uh, like I work with the Arts Council as a creative associate um, where I support schools to uh, develop art programs that are unique and um, to their interests and their needs. And only yesterday I was in a school called Gwaelskol Vigaulig, which had 600 students, primary school students, mm -hmm. and they all had beautiful Irish. Um, so it was like a little microcosm of a Gwaeltacht in this school alone. And also I went to a school called Skolena in Spittle, where you'd nearly expect everybody to have Irish because they're in the Gwaeltacht, but not necessarily so in Galway. So it's very much alive, um, probably more so though in schools that are Gwael schools or that are based in Gwaeltacht places. 
Um, and in Gwaelskol, the teacher, the principal was telling me yesterday that the children don't engage in any um, English classes or English language activities until they're in first class. So they keep it purely Irish, which is a great introduction, I think. How old are they when they are in first class? Um, so they go from junior infants to senior um, into first class. So okay. maybe uh, six, okay. six, seven. Yeah. Yeah. Just your terms are different than we have. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. have a similar thing with French here um, in the English speaking parts of Canada where we call it French immersion. So I was part of the first wave of those kids. Okay. We didn't have any English until a certain age. Age, either. yeah. Although we were Anglophone speakers at home, but it does work. When you learn yes. a language that young, it doesn't leave you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's, I have to say, it's been such a privilege to have both languages. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely formed me as a person. It's added, it's given me a lot in terms of um, richness, in terms of um, like a lot of people talk about how the, the poetic, the poetic descriptions within the Irish language um, and whether or not I think you know that consciously, I think that when you have Irish and then you work in English, I think it informs your in, my English work, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, yeah, definitely. I think it adds to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like a different person. I did a project on that once uh, for Radio Nagoltachta and I spoke to a lot of people and a lot of, about their, you know, being bilingual and a lot of people say that they feel like two different people depending mm -hmm. on what language they're speaking. Um, and I would definitely feel the same. Do you feel it between French and, and English? Yeah, I, well, I'm very interested in languages and I've studied many languages as a hobby, but not to mm -hmm. a very high level. But mm -hmm. other people I've talked to about language, I mean, I think you think differently in different yes. languages and it's it's yeah. a beautiful way to get to know another culture yeah if yeah. it's and in terms of your exploration of traditional shannos and mm -hmm. irish music in general since you came to it a little bit later in life do you continue yeah. to dive into that i mean it's such a wealth yes um definitely and i often find it's through collaborative um work where new doors open which is mm -hmm. lovely there are some things that you you can't know until you bounce off somebody else. Yeah. So, for example, um, very recently, I worked with um, an amazing musician called Matthew Nolan and again, Kevin Murphy on cello. And we were invited to create a live score for a film called I Am Not Legend by mm -hmm. Andrea Mastrovito. Um, and Matthew had wild ideas, which I completely went for, including an Irish translation of a Joy Division song, um, but also, which worked, was gorgeous and we want to record it. Um, but Matthew um, is a genius with synths and loop pedals, uh, which I'm not at all. <laughs> I'm not technically minded that way. And I sang Queen. It's also on the Queen album on Queena. But what he did with it was like, wow, we have to, I need to record this iteration of it because it brought it somewhere else completely. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that just recent project that I did with Matthew pulled me into singing Shanos in a darker way, in a darker, slower way, and using a lower register of my voice that I probably mm -hmm. may, mightn't have accessed before. And I'm very excited about that mm -hmm. now. And um, even um, there is a, oh, I like, I really love the old Irish poets, um, you know, Egon O'Rahalig and um, I can't think of, um, another name straight off the top of my head now, but for another project that I did called Weathering, I was looking at um, oligons. Um, so an oligon is another word for lament, but it's, it should be nearly like, it takes, it takes its oration from liturgy, the repetition of words that begin with the same letter, or so it almost becomes chant-like, ch chant -like in order to iterate more and more emphasis on certain things um, and one of the verses that we used for that film um, recently was a me in the chreek a chwil sa hablach the do the vrishy a chwil sa chwil do you know it almost sounds like a like a curse um, and yeah so at the moment I'm looking at incantation 
Um, I'm trying actually to do a little bit of research on incantation in Irish traditional practices. I haven't found much material yet, um, but definitely that that repetition and bardic way of um, a kind of a powerful rhetoric. I, I'd like to to explore that a little bit mm -hmm. more. Yeah, in a contemporary way. <laughs> well, you're you're so. Um... You're so creative and curious, and, and it's wonderful how you go off on your tangents so deeply. Yes. <laughs> but I, I hope that you will make another traditional album. Yeah, from... I definitely <laughs> definitely want to. I definitely would love to. Um, I, the thing that I find difficult is how to merge my contemporary work mm -hmm. with the traditional. Like, it's, it's, it's easier for me to bring traditional repertoire into the contemporary uh, visual art work. Mm -hmm. Um, that it is the other way around. And um, as time goes on, I'm thinking maybe that's just OK. I just I, I don't it's not something I have to to figure out. Maybe mm -hmm. they just belong in different in different camps okay. and I can enjoy both. Yeah. The thing that people get confused by is if somebody comes to a concert of mine, they think that's all I do. Um, and then they might later discover the the more contemporary arts practice. And I think in, we live in a world of categories. Um, <laughs> and it can be very difficult to be several things at the same time sometimes. Mm. Um, but you just have to roll with it, don't you? Don't you yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, very inspiring. So, so thanks Thank so, so much. much. Thank you. I really enjoyed chatting to you. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode. There's such a fascinating variety to life and music, and this series features wonderful musicians worldwide with in-depth conversations and great music, with over 100 episodes to explore. Many episodes feature guests playing music spontaneously as part of the episode or sharing performances and albums. I hope that the inspiration and connection found in a meaningful creative life, the challenges faced, and the stories from such a diversity of artists will draw you into this weekly series with many topics that will resonate with all listeners. Please share your favorite episodes with your friends and do consider supporting this independent podcast. The link is in the description. Have a great week.